what the U.S. government found and then covered up in Antarctica will be surprising. An article October 21st in Telehub, there's evidence that warm waters and life exist in the Antarctic. Is this evidence of the hollow earth? It's an article by Shepard Ambelas. It's an amazing story everybody should know. And it's been a cover-up for many years. One of the most compelling accounts is this one. Operation High Jump put nearly 5,000 U.S. military personnel along with every resource available to the Navy's disposal in the hands of Admiral Richard Byrd, the operations leader of the U.S. naval mission into the Antarctic. So every resource of the entire U.S. Navy was made available for Admiral Byrd's team and we have to take into account that it was an unusually uh, bold move for American military at the time since nations and world economies were still volatile from the war's aftermath. And we have to ask questions. Why would the U.S. military be seeking to expand so many resources at the risk of great collateral loss to explore such a harsh region of the planet as Antarctica? What was the rush and what did they know? So we find a lot of details regarding Operation High Jump have been carefully tucked away over the years and we find that uh, internet sources explain little about the mission titled the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program 1946 to 47 it says the United States operation organized by Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd Jr. U.S. Navy retired officer in charge task force 68 and led by Rear Admiral Richard Cruzen, Cruzen U.S. Navy Commander Officer Task Force 68 Operation High Jump commenced August 26, 1946 after the Second World War, ended about a year before that, and ended in late February of 1947. The Task Force 68 included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and multiple aircraft. The primary mission of Operation High Jump was to establish the Antarctic Research Base Little America 4. High Jump's aims, according to the U.S. Navy report, on the operation were these. 1. Training personnel and testing equipment in frigid conditions. 2. Consolidating and extending United States sovereignty over the largest practicable area of the Antarctic continent. This was publicly denied as a goal even before the expedition uh, ended. Three determining the feasibility of establishing, maintaining, and utilizing bases in the Antarctic and investigating possible base sites. 4. Developing techniques for establishing, maintaining, and utilizing air bases on ice, with particular attention to later applicability of such techniques to operations in interior Greenland, where conditions are comparable to those in the Antarctic. 5. Amplifying existing stores of knowledge, knowledge of hydrographic, geographic, and geological, meteorological, and electromagnetic propagation conditions in the area. Six, supplementary objectives of the Nanook expedition. The Nanook operation was the smaller equivalent conducted off eastern Greenland. So uh, it's interesting that uh, actual missions detail were shrouded by secrecy, hidden from the American public, and leads us to where we're at this point. Excerpts from the report entitled The Antarctica Enigma reads, Little other information was released to the media about the mission, although most journalists were suspicious of its true purpose given the huge amount of military hardware involved. The U.S. Navy also strongly emphasized that Operation High Jump was going to be a, a Navy show Admiral Ramsey preliminary orders of August 26, 1946 stated that the Chief of Naval Operations will deal with other government only government agencies and that no diplomatic negotiations are required. No foreign observers will be accepted. Not exactly an invitation to scrutiny even from other arms of the government. Admiral Byrd was a strategic 
choices. He was a national hero to the Americans. He had pioneered the technology that would be a foundation for modern polar exploration and investigation, had been repeatedly decorated and had undertaken many expeditions to Antarctica and was also the first man to fly over both poles, north and south. However, the task force itself remained strictly under the military command of Rear Admiral Richard Cruzen. Unfortunately, the ship's central group entered the ice pack of the Ross Sea on December 31st, 46, and found conditions as bad as had been noted for over a century. Sea breakers such as the U.S. CGC Burton Island, a ship that had only recently been commissioned and was still undergoing sea trials off the California coast when Operation High Jump was launched, fought to cut away through the ice to help the men land. Richard Cruzen was one of the few men to have located at several oases. So these several oases locations were the actual real reason the expedition team was sent there in the first place, although at the time only those with a top secret clearance would truly know the mission's true objective. An excerpt from the Davies County Historical Society reads, According to a neighbor report, 1,000 miles off New Coastline was discovered on exploratory trips by the Bear and Bird Seaplane. Commented by Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox for his superior seamanship, ability, courage, determination, efficiency, and good judgment in dangerous emergencies, Cruzen was one of the 16 members of the 1939-41 expedition who received the Antarctic Expedition Medal presented in November 46. On December 2nd of 46, Cruzen once more set sail for the Antarctic continent, this time a task force commander under Admiral Byrd of the Navy's Antarctic Development Project, also known as Hop Operation High Jump. Cruzen led a force of 13 ships carrying some 4,000 men, including meteorologists, zoologists, physicists, and experts from oceanographic studies institutes to uh, the adventure of the lifetime. Besides looking for new scientific data, another purpose of the expedition was to train Navy personnel and to test standard Navy ships and the equipment in cold weather operations. Crews and navigated through an ice pack of several hundred miles before reaching Little America. Icebergs and unpredictable weather were formidable foes during the course of the expedition. Among the discoveries made in 46-47 expedition was the sighting of two oases. One, a region of ice-free lakes and land. More than 300,000 square miles of unpathed territory were charted on aerial mapping operations. Their observations proved that radical changes would have to be made on existing maps of the Antarctic. So, why would warm spots and warm water exist in the Antarctic? What does that mean? Researchers such as Dr. Brooks Agnew and others have deeply considered the possibility that the Earth itself could be a hollow uh, egg-like lake shape, meaning that there is a hollow Earth, rising to the hollow Earth theory. Although this theory seems hard to comprehend because we've been told exactly the opposite our entire lives in school and so on. So what if the Earth was hollow? Would that be possible? And is there evidence to back this up? And the answer is yes. Evidence shows that the Earth, Earth rings like a bell after an earthquake for a period of up to about 60 minutes. And that's why some scientists and researchers say that this is due to the fact that the Earth is hollow. If the Earth had a solid core, then the Earth, the earthquake happened, it would, when the earthquake happened, it would likely absorb all of the vibration and not resonate it like a bell. This is just one detail that should open our minds to the possibility that the planet is hollow. Virtually every culture and civilization across the planet throughout the ages has documented what appears to be the existence of a hollow earth. According to Dr. Brooks Agnew, a hollow earth is a very real possibility. Agnew has focused his studies on the North Pole region. He and his team plan to one day locate a documented polar depression, thus launching test overflights from a nuclear-powered icebreaker. Brooks and his team plan a scientific expedition to the brim of the hollow earth, which proves to be unsuccessful at this time due to a lack of his funding. Brooks plans to use a sun compass and a gyroscope. 
above the 60th parallel to get accurate measurements of the oceanic depression. If the rate of change begins to increase, then likely the team would be entering the long elusive polar depression which has been reported by ancient Viking explorers and modern day seamen alike. Agnew talks about the formation of planets, Sir Isaac Newton, difference between thick and thin crust physics, zero gravity and more on various interviews that he's made. And we also have this wonderful mystery of what happened to the reindeer that the uh, Norwegian whalers left on Antarctica over a hundred years ago. They did not believe that the reindeer would live. However, a hundred years later, they're thriving and nobody can get rid of them. It's a mystery how they, they survive in the Antarctic. And we also have to remember the recent scientific experiments that uh, the International Space Station crew had conducted in space when they were conducting the water experiments. They would have a drop of water which would take on a circular shape and when they introduced little uh, particles of orange peels inside, the orange peels would come and float onto the surface of the water bubble, leaving the, the weight, the, uh, showing that the weight, the heavy weight of the items floated to the surface and were not found in the center. And this confused them, we thought, because they believed that it, they would stay in the center of the water bubble. So that's a small type of an example of what would happen in a planet, a body of a planet, where the crust or heavy elements would come and float towards the surface of the planet. I'll leave a link below for you for this article.